You know, one of the things that we learn as we go through this life is that we all talk just a little bit differently. You listen to folks and you can gauge pretty much what part of the country they are from by the way that they talk. I've had several people ask me, where are you from? And I say, Columbus, Ohio. And they say, no, you're not. <laughs> I, I guess I don't know where I was brought up. But maybe I talk just a little bit differently than the folks that come from this area. I had parents that grew up in West Virginia. I imagine I got some of that from them. I, I've spent time in Tennessee. And you know, you talk to people and it doesn't take long to figure out where they're from. We read about that in the Bible. The people that were there when Jesus was crucified, or at least for his trial, recognized that Peter was one that was with Jesus because as Mark 14 verse 70 tells us, they could tell by his speech he was a Galilean. He was a northern Jew instead of a southern Jew. And, and they could tell the difference. I lived in the South for a while. And you have to learn a little bit of a different vocabulary. I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's just a little bit different. For instance, someone might talk about what they're fixing to do this afternoon. That means they're getting ready to do it. They're planning on doing it, but they use that term fixing a lot. They'll talk about carrying people. I'm going to carry my Aunt Laura to the grocery store today. Well, that doesn't mean that they're going to pick her up. It means they're going to take her in their car to the grocery store. Someone might say, I am fixing to carry someone to this place. And if you don't know what's being talked about, you're in the dark. A term that is used often in the South, maybe not as often as it used to be, is the term reckon. Now, that's a legitimate word. It's not a made-up word. It's not a slang word. And we read of it in the scriptures. Reckon. I have heard all my life my dad tell a story about my mom. Now, you know that my mom is from southern West Virginia, and she talks low and slow. And he's teased her about that all her life. And he likes to tell the story that when they got married, the preacher said to my dad, do you? And he said, I do. And he said to the, my mom, do you? And she said, I reckon. <laughs> now she denies that. He says it's the truth. I'll let you decide who you want to believe. But we find this term, reckon, in the scriptures on a number of occasions. And like I said, it is a, a legitimate term. You look up the meaning of this word, reckon, and it can mean to establish by counting or calculation. It is used often in the scriptures in this way. When there is a counting that takes place, there is a reckoning of the number of people. It can mean to consider or regard in a specific way. And again, it is used on a few occasions in this way in the scriptures. Consider this, reckon this, and we'll notice that as we study this morning. It also can mean to believe something is true or possible. Bubba might say, do you believe that my dog coon seven or my my dog treed seven coons last night? And his friend might say, I reckon. And he means he believes it. And then it can also mean I guess or I imagine. That's evidently the way my mom used it in that wedding ceremony. I, I reckon. I guess. Now, in the scriptures, for the most part, it is used always as this idea of calculation or counting or the idea of consider. In fact, in other translations, it might be the word consider that is there or count that is there. Evidently, Paul was a southern Jew because in his writings, in particular in the book of Romans, 
we find him using this term, reckon. And I want us to look at a few of those passages. And I want us to do some reckoning this morning as we notice the places where Paul uses this phrase. So let's begin in Romans chapter 4 and verses 1 through 8. And we're going to talk about how we should reckon we are blessed by the grace of God. Let's make sure that we reckon, we consider this. When we get to Romans chapter 4, Paul is trying to deal with a subject that that the church is wrestling with as it begins. We remember that Christianity comes out of Judaism. It's not part of Judaism, but Judaism brings us to Christ. And the first converts were Jews. Many of those Jews thought Christianity, the gospel, was only for them. Then Cornelius is taught the gospel, and they realize it's for the Gentiles as well. But there are many of them that believe, okay, if the Gentiles are going to be part of this, they need to observe the law of Moses. They need to practice circumcision. Of course, the Holy Spirit is going to explain in Acts 15, that is not the case. The law of Moses has been done away with. That covenant of circumcision, that's not part of the the New Testament. And so they don't have to practice those things. But in spite of the teaching of the Holy Spirit and then those faithful brethren that went forth with that message, there still were those who put forth this idea. And so you have in the book of Romans, in the book of Galatians, in the book of Hebrews, and in a couple other letters, the writers having to deal with this subject. And Here in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through through 8, Paul is going to deal with it. And he's going to explain to them that their hero, Abraham, he was not justified by the law. He wasn't under the law. The law would not come for another 400 years. And he was said to be righteous before God gave him the covenant of circumcision. So if Abraham can be justified, if he can be said to be righteous by God, being forgiven by God, apart from these things, why should it surprise anyone that under the gospel we are made righteous? Not by the law, not by practicing circumcision, but by obedience to the will of God. So with that in mind, look at these verses with me. Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Was Abraham justified by works? Absolutely not. He hadn't earned that justification but he didn't receive it through the law or through circumcision either so what had he found well here's where we go what for what saith the scripture you have a bible question where should we always go (laughs) to god's word and so paul points them in that direction what do the scriptures say for what saith the scripture Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's a quotation of Genesis 15 and verse 6, where faithful Abraham is said to be righteous by God, not by works of the law, but through the law of faith, as it is referred to in Romans chapter 3. This man who was faithfully obedient unto the Lord is made righteous, said to be righteous, declared to be righteous by God. He's forgiven. And it's not by the law or by circumcision. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, 
but of debt. Here's our word, that word reckoned. And so if someone were able to live a sinless life, I, I mean completely sinless, God would not hesitate to give them the reward of salvation. The problem is no man can do that. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. The only one to live that sinless life is our Savior. Abraham didn't do it, and neither can we. Verse 5 then, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. No, we can't make it so that God owes us salvation because we're not sinless. How then can we be without sin? Only by the grace of God. Only through the blood of Christ can we be made righteous. Can we stand as righteous before God in judgment? And my friends, this is the extending of God's grace. God's grace has given us a way to be made righteous. God's grace has revealed to us what we must do in order to be made righteous. It is up to us then, just like it was up to Abraham, to respond to that grace. Remember, these were people back in or over in Romans 6 and verse 17 that had obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine which had been delivered unto them. And so, like Abraham, not saved by the law, works of the law, not saved by circumcision, but made righteous by God, forgiven by God. And so his point is, if Abraham could be made righteous apart from the law, why would it seem so strange to you that we today can be made righteous apart from the law? In fact, that we are. It's not by the works of the law that man is made righteous. In verse 6, he says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, that is, the works of the law saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That word impute means to ascribe or to attribute. And truly, the person who is said to be righteous by God, what a blessing that is. And so we like Paul was doing here, need to reckon about how blessed we are by the grace of God. Because we have sinned. We can't say to God, you owe us this. But through His gospel, we can be made righteous. How blessed we are. Gone is all my debt of sin. A great change is wrought within. And to rise, I now begin. Or to live, I now begin, risen from the fall. Yet the debt I did not pay. Someone died for me that day. Sweeping all the debt away, Jesus paid it all. Let's make sure that when he comes to this idea of reckoning, that we reckon about how blessed we are by the grace of God. Now, let's notice another place where Paul uses this term, reckon. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 6 and verses 8 through 14. And let's reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God. When we get to Romans chapter 6, Paul has asked a question. Shall we continue in sin? He'd been talking about grace. And he talked about grace being greater than sin. And he was anticipating the reasoning of some folks. Well, let's see. If there's more grace where there's more sin, 
Shouldn't we just keep on sinning so that we can get more and more grace? And so he asked the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer, church? God forbid. Absolutely not. Why? Because we are dead to sin. We're dead to sin. We died with Christ. We were baptized into his death. And just as Christ rose from that grave, we raised to walk in newness of life. Sin no longer having the rule over us. We've been made free from it. And so we're not going to go back to it. We are dead unto sin, but alive unto God. Notice in verse 8 now. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. You know, in the English language, that sounds like the living is going to start later. We've died with him, and one day we'll live with him. And that's certainly true. But the idea of this passage is that we're living with him right now. We're living for him right now. He is our king. He is our Lord. He is our guide. He is our teacher. We are living with him now. Dead unto sin, living with him now. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Our Savior died and was buried in the tomb. But when he came up from that grave, death had no more dominion over him. And my friends, when we come up from the grave of baptism, spiritual death has no more dominion over us. Verse 10 for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. His sacrifice was a once for all time sacrifice. Likewise, reckon, there's our word. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. As Christians, we are both dead and alive. We're dead to sin. We're alive unto God. And so we want to live our lives that way. Being people that are dead to sin. No longer walking in sin. But living that godly life. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Let's consider this body that God has given us as an instrument, he says. An instrument not to be involved in sin, but an instrument to do service unto God. Remember, Christ is the one that's purchased us. Our bodies belong unto Him. Now that we are dead to sin, we're not going to be ruled by the passions or the desires of this body. We're not going to let the desires of this body lead us to spiritual and eternal damnation. Instead, we're going to be dead to sin and be servants unto our God. This body, an instrument in his service. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Folks, that doesn't mean that under grace we have no law at all. We certainly do. We have the law of Christ. But what it is saying is that the predominant feature of the gospel is grace. Not a law that condemns like the law of Moses, but 
the grace of God, living the way He wants us to, reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto Christ, buried with Christ, my blessed Redeemer, dead to the old life of folly and sin. Satan may call, the world may entreat me. There is no voice that answers within. Dead to the world, to voices that call me, living anew, obedient but free. Dead to the joys that once did enthrall me, yet tis not I, but Christ liveth in me. Reckoning. Reckon yourselves dead unto sin, but alive unto God. There's one more place that we find Paul using this term in the book of Romans. It's in chapter 8, and we're going to notice verses 18 through 25. Reckon that our sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come. Let's begin looking there at verse 18, and you see this very idea in our term once more. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul is trying to encourage his fellow Christians. We are not going to give up. No matter what we have to go through, no matter how difficult the road may be, we will not stop learn, uh, serving our Lord. The latter part of this chapter, Romans chapter 8, is that place where you find those ideas. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? There's nothing upon this earth that can. We're more than conquerors through Him. And so He's encouraging them. You reckon this way. You consider this. That no matter what we go through, what we will receive is going to far outweigh, outdo any difficulties that we may face. Now He's going to go on talking about this idea he says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, this is key to understanding this section of scripture here. Because he mentions the creature and the creation a couple of times here. He is not referring to this ball, this earth. Some people have taken it that way. That this this earth is waiting to be renewed and, and, and it's groaning as well. That's not what's being talked about. When he talks about the creature here, he's talking about the church. And you say, that, that doesn't seem right. How's the church a creature? Well, the church was created. We are made new creatures. Yes, the Bible refers to the church in this way. And so it is the church, the creature, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. We're waiting for that reward when time, when suffering will be no more. For the creature, the church, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that... Now, here he is referring to all humanity. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Here's his point. Folks, we're human beings. And that means we're going to suffer. That means we're subject to going through hard times. And my friends, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. You're going to suffer in this life. Because we are human beings. These bodies are going to wear out. Everybody faces sickness. Everybody goes through losses. Everybody can have financial difficulties. Difficulty with relationships. Difficulty with government. Life's hard. It's difficult on us all, and we're all subject to those things. The choice that we have is, do you want to go through those things all on your own? 
or do you want to go through them with God? Do you want to try and face everything by yourself? Or do you want the hand of the Lord walking with you? That's the choice. We're going to suffer in this life. We're going to face hardships. You want to do it by yourself or with the Lord? And here he's writing to these fellow Christians explaining, yes, we go through these difficulties. And yes, I realize that there are some difficulties that come on, upon us because we are Christians. But even if, if, if we turn away from Christ, you're still going to go through suffering. And so he's encouraging them. You keep holding on. He even adds in verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. I believe he's talking about the apostles there. First fruits of the Spirit being their ability to perform miracles. Even with the gifts that were given unto them, they still suffered. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? For if we hope, but if we hope for that we see not, then we, do we with patience wait for it. We're still looking forward to the redemption. Yes, we are the redeemed, but we're suffering here upon this earth. We're subject to that. But one day... All of that will be no more. No more hardships or difficulties. No more struggles, frustrations. No more pain, suffering. No more death. No more separation. And so we long for that. We're not experiencing it now, but one day we will. So you reckon, folks... He says, you reckon that the sufferings you're going through now, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory that is waiting for us. You keep that hope in your mind, in your heart, always. It sustains us. It keeps us serving the Lord. Often I'm hindered on my way. Burden so heavy, I almost fall. Then I hear Jesus sweetly say, Heaven will surely be worth it all. Heaven will surely be worth it all, worth all the sorrows that here befall. And after this life, with all its strife, heaven will surely be worth it all. And so he reminds us to reckon. And when you hear that term the next time, I, I hope you smile a little bit. I hope you think about my mom. And you remember her saying, I reckon, whether she did or not. But I hope even more than that, you remember the things that Paul tells us to reckon about. He reminds us to reckon how blessed we are by the grace of God. And he reminds us to reckon that we are dead unto sin, but alive unto God and he wants us to reckon to understand that the suffering we go through now it can't begin to compare with the glory that shall be given unto us one day I reckon you know Paul wasn't the only one that talked about reckoning in Matthew chapter 25 in verse 19 when Jesus is telling us the parable of the talents, he says that the Lord of those servants who had been gone for a long time, he came back and he calls them unto him and he reckons with them. Folks, there is a day of reckoning that's coming for all of us. And that's the day we need to be ready for. Are you ready for that great day of reckoning? To stand before the Lord, confess His name and bow the knee unto Him? Will it be in vain, something that you do too late because you failed to obey Him in this life? 
Or will you be ready for that day of reckoning? Friend, if you need to obey the gospel, take advantage of the opportunity God has given you today. Come with that penitent heart, believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Be willing to confess that before men, and then put him on in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. We'd love to assist you. And if you're one who has obeyed, but you've fallen away, and, and you need to come back, this invitation's for you. And so if you're subject in any way, please come as we stand and sing this good song.